Good morning, everyone. It's such a nice day out today that I thought I would sit outside while I read to you. There's a nice breeze and the sun is shining bright. So I figured this would be a good place to read so that I could get outside and enjoy some of the weather. So we are starting off with chapter nine today of If We Were Giants. When we left Kira, she was running very quickly trying to catch her dad. So let's see what happens. Kira stumbled down the rough volcano wall, falling and skinning her knee, but she popped right back up again. She ran through the searing pain of a stitch in her side, ignored the sharp stone she stepped on and her parched throat that cried out for water. Parched is when you're really dry and you're desperate for a drink. Soon it was so dark, she could hardly see where she was placing her next footstep. Still, she ran. Nearing the bottom of the wall, she encountered a great rocky ridge and hurriedly picked her way along its length. On the other side would be the plains, and then it would be a dead sprint all the way to Nafalu. She would somehow... Paha! Was this a vision created out of pure desperation? Taro dashing around the side of the ridge in disheveled robes? She stood frozen to the spot, squinting through the murky twilight as the moon rose to replace the sun. The vision ran right up to her, dropped to one knee and grabbed her fiercely by her shoulders. This was all happening so quickly she couldn't tell what was real. The rough way his fingers dug into her flesh told her this was no hallucination, but she simply couldn't believe the expression on her father's face. His eye eyes so wild it seemed as if they were staring right through her kira what are you doing out here i i didn't there's no time he cupped her face with both of his hands they are nearly here i don't know how but they found out about zadu they know where we live the inside of kira's belly went cold listen to me he glanced frantically over his shoulder then back at kira you need to hide and when it is safe you must go to luke way tell the leader of their tribe who you are and what you have seen ask them to shelter you until it is safe to return another desperate look behind them if it is ever safe to return paha i don't want taro pulled her close planted a rough kiss on her cheek then embraced her squeezing so hard that it hurt I love you, Kira, he fiercely whispered into her ear. Never forget that. A great shout rose from the other side of the ridge, answered by more voices roaring in unison. Taro pulled back, listening, his eyes growing even wider. Kira felt like she was stuck in a terrible dream. None of this seemed like it could be happening. Not really, especially not this fast. Listen carefully, Kira. Taro motioned to a small protected area underneath a rocky overhang. He took her by the shoulders and pushed her down, first on her knees and then over onto her side. Limp from exhaustion and terror, she curled up into a ball like a scared armadillo. He shoved her underneath the outcropping of stone. But Paha, I, please Kira, his voice was thick. Peeking out, she saw something she had never seen before. Her father was crying. Somehow that single detail cut through everything else that was happening. The tears streaming down Taro's face, making all this horribly real. He uprooted some brush and pressed it under the lip of rock covering her. I must go. I have to try and warn the others. Don't move until it's safe. I love you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I couldn't do more to protect you, my sweet one. Then he turned and raced away, climbing the side of the volcano in long, lopping strides. Kira whimpered and reached out for him, but she froze when she heard the strange men shouting again. Closer this time, she pulled her arm back under the ledge. In another moment, a group of tall warriors from the camp around the ridge lighting up the night sky with flaming torches. The group blasted right past her, sending a cloud of dust into her hid hiding place. She squeezed her eyes shut, tasting dirt that threatened to choke her. By the gods, they covered so much ground in those great bounding strides. How would her father ever have a chance to warn the people of Sudu? 
Some long minutes later, when the entire procession had passed, she was able to peel open her eyes. She watched through the leaves in horror as her nightmare came true. Her father disappeared into the volcano, but with the entire group of Red Streak's men right on her heels. They all had those terrible, shiny blades in their hands pointing at the sky, the light from their flames winking off the cruel, sharpened tips. A few of them dashed in the tunnel. The others waited outside the entrance. Just a few minutes later, the first warriors returned and waved in the rest. The assembly, it looked like an even bigger group than she had seen in the woods. If that were possible, stormed into the same entrance she and Tico had snuck back through last night, squeezing those long gray bodies and all of that armor and weaponry through the crack in Zadu's volcano wall. All the air left Kira in a dizzying rush. Had the takers followed her and Tico as they raced across the plains towards home? Oh dear gods, that was the only possible explanation. Kira went lightheaded as she couldn't suck in a desperately needed breath. Zadu had lived peacefully behind the protective walls of the volcano for generation upon generation. And after Kira's first unauthorized trip outside, they were overrun with the space of a single day. Zadu was being seen by outsider eyes for the first time at this very moment. Unthinkable, yet it was happening and she was to blame. The interior of the volcano was being met with those cruel weapons and open flames while she was out here. No one was safe. Paha, Maha, Little Tico, all her friends, and it was entirely her fault. That's when Kira's mind gave out and the world went dark. When she came to, it was many hours later, the sun was directly overhead, the air hot and still. She was so stiff she could barely move. Her arms and legs were scratched up from the brush. She itched all over and grit coated her tongue. As she took inventory of her body, her mind slowly recalled where she was and why. Overwhelmed with fear, dread, and guilt, she was unable to muster the energy to fix her minor discomforts. A feeling settled into her chest so strongly, she knew it would always be there from this point on. She deserved to be miserable now and forever. She lay there listless until the sky darkened again. The moon rose slowly over the volcano and the air became so cold she couldn't stop shivering. Occasionally, warriors marched back and forth past her and her hiding spot. Kara squeezed her eyes shut. She clapped her hands over her ears, but still the restless sound of their pounding boots came. When the sun rose again, Kira's mouth was so dry that it hurt to move her tongue. An idea drifted in, slipped under the ledge of rock and wormed its way into her head. If she didn't get out soon and get some water, she was going to die here. Kira closed her eyes tightly again and didn't move, giving herself over to fate. The sound of rain falling on the rock outside woke Kira. In all the confusion of the last few days, she had missed the telltale signs of an incoming monsoon, but it was here now. The water fell in great sheets. Acting more on deep-seated instinct than a conscience will to survive, Kira stuck her hand out from under the ledge, let the rain wet her fingers, and pulled them back to suck on them. Her throat was so dry and constricted that at first it felt like she was swallowing sand. But as she slowly collected fresh rainwater, her mouth loosened up and she gained a bit of strength. She eventually crawled into the open, leaving herself completely exposed. But what of it? True, one of the warriors could spot her, but that would only speed up what needed to happen. Kira should not be allowed to live. She stood there in the downpour, tears mixing with the rain streaming down her face. She looked up at the hidden entrance to the volcano, but there was no one about. Were all the takers inside now using everything the Seduans had built to keep themselves dry and warm and fed? How could she have lost her entire world so quickly? How could it? Oh gods, how could it possibly have been all her fault? She'd only wanted to help. She wanted to serve Zadu and help her father and use stories to teach and protect her people. And now Zadu and Paha and all of his stories, she felt dizzy and sick to her stomach, but she had to know what was happening inside, what she had caused to happen. 
Kira knew better than to try going through the nearby entrance, the warriors would have manned it first thing. So instead, she summoned a reserve of energy she didn't think she possessed and willed her shaking legs to climb to the very top of the volcano. When she arrived, Kira lifted her gaze from the ground to find something straight out of one of her father's stories, smoke. Not the gentle, continuous puffs the Kala twins produced to create the illusion that the volcano was about to erupt. Instead, big, dark, ominous clouds of choking smoke were billowing from the top of the crater. When she made it to the rim, she collapsed, her cheek pressed against the dirt. She grabbed the lip of the crater and pulled herself forward on her belly, trying to find a break in the smoke where she could breathe. As her eyes adjusted, she was able to peer down into the only place she had ever called home. She was thankful for all that smoke. The hazy picture that emerged was horrifying enough. Nearly every structure in the community was a heap of charred wood and ash. There was no sign of life inside. The fire demons had turned out to be real after all. She pushed herself, choking and gaggering, and staggered away from the crater and stumbled back down the volcano wall. Her mind tried to find explanations for what she had seen. It didn't work. As she half walked, half slid down the rain slick mountain, she tried to turn her mind off entirely. But that didn't work either. Paha had told her to go back to Luke Y for sanctuary. She didn't deserve that. Besides, one of the takers would probably follow her and she would lead him right to a fresh village for the slaughter. That was her legacy now. Instead of spreading stories, she spread destruction. She would not go to Lukwai or Nafalu or any place where there were people trying to enjoy their lives. Her exhausted and cramped legs plodded on until she had walked straight off the volcano. She waded through tall grass and thorny bushes and puddles and under trees until finally she was standing on the banks of the great river. The ledge she was on overlooked the rushing water some 10 or so feet below, but this downpour was working quickly. She could see the swollen river rising to meet her. The deluge was creating tangles of white water, swift eddies and boiling whirlpools. If someone were to fall in, they would have no chance. Their body would be spun around and dragged under and tossed about until a life was sucked out of them. They would be gone and all their terrible memories would be gone with them. Perhaps Kira's feet dislodged some rocks or maybe the strong wind had made the ledge unstable. In any case, the ground slid underneath her. Kira fell into the river and was swept away from everything she had ever known. She was freezing. Chill had seeped into her body so completely that it felt like an essential part of her. She went where the current took her. There was no other choice. She was spun this way and that, sucked under the water only to be spit out above the surface several suffocating moments later. Her body bounced off logs and rocks as if it were a piece of trash that had been dumped into the current. If she weren't numb with cold, she would have felt the pain much more keenly. Darkness started creeping in around the edges of her vision. Her physical numbness was so complete it no longer fazed her when freezing white water splashed over her face. Her emotional numbness was so complete she didn't care if she ever made it out of here. Time became meaningless. She had always been here. The darkness increased, limiting her sight. The numbness continued to seep in until she couldn't feel anything anymore until the hand, warm and strong, it slipped into hers. It pulled her, gave her direction, reminded her there were other things besides cold and wet and pain. That hand became her entire world. Then there was total darkness. When she regained the tiniest part of herself, she found the strength to open her eyes. She saw a boy's face, unfamiliar and kind. He looked down at her, his mouth moved. Several moments later, the voice came to her, muffled and distorted as if she were still underwater. Maybe she was, you're going to be okay. No, she wanted to tell him, I'm not. 
but she couldn't say anything. Her lips didn't feel right. She wasn't touching the ground. At first, she thought she might be floating, but then she understood that this boy was carrying her. As a canopy of branches rushed by overhead, she realized she was in a forest. What's your name? The boy asked her. Kira, she answered in her head. Was that still her name? Did she actually have a name if everyone who knew it was gone? You're going to be okay, he said again. Then they were standing at the base of a tree and the boy was craning his neck to look up, yelling for help. And then it was black again. Part two, the tree folk. This is chapter 10. Any member of the tree folk could leave the community and wander about the surrounding lands whenever they wanted, but 14 year old Kira rarely did. Instead, it was her preference to stay safely inside the hut, doing daily chores such as preparing food or mending clothes. She had to admit though that safe was a relative turn when the hut was located more than 200 dizzying feet above the ground. So they live up in the trees instead of her tribe, which lived under the volcano. Even after four years of living in it, four years has gone by now. Kira still marveled at the structure. The dwelling had been built in a circle around the top of a great tree. The trunk rose through a hole in the middle of the floor in the main living room and disappeared through the roof. Up this high, the trunk was much thinner than it was at the forest floor far below, but it was still thick enough to provide sturdy support for the hut and the four people who lived there. Underneath the wooden platform that served as a floor hung a series of sleeping hammocks accessible through trapdoors. Branches had been cleared to allow room for the living space where the family kept their possessions and shared meals. A stone fire pit for cooking had been constructed well away from the tree trunk underneath a hole in the roof that let smoke escape. Many layers of smooth river rocks formed the base. You had to be extremely careful when fire, with fire when you lived at the top of a towering tree. One stray spark could, Kira shook her head to make that thought go away. Fire was definitely one of her memory traps. A memory trap could suck you in like a whirlpool and force her to spin backwards back to before. And then her mind dragging her heart along with it would end up in a very bad place. It had happened often when she first arrived. Almost everything had been a memory trap and whenever she allowed herself to deal, to dwell on certain things, she would inevitably spiral downward. Then she'd spend several days in a row not talking and hardly moving. She knew it had frightened and disturbed the people who had taken her in, and she didn't want that. They'd been very kind to her. Kira had become quite adept at avoiding those mental pitfalls. At first, it felt like physically pushing the bad thoughts away against their will, cramming them into two small boxes and shoving them back into the deep storage areas of her brain. But now she could do it almost automatically, avoid a looming memory trap as if she were merely sidestepping an ankle twisting hole while walking in the woods. When the bad thoughts about fire threatened to pop up, she shifted her attention to the pot of stool, stew bubbling over the flames. It was time to dip a wooden ladle into the soupy mixture of mushrooms, greens, and meat and taste test it. But Kira made a face after one slurp. She definitely needed to add salt before the others returned. She stood and ran a finger along the shelf of kitchen goods, then pursed her lips and blew out a frustrated breath. The salt bowl was nearly empty. Again, she was pretty sure it was Luan's turn to refill it, but she was out having fun somewhere in the forest again. Kira sighed. It would take over half an hour to make her way to the salt caverns, maybe 45 minutes, definitely more than an hour round trip. Dinner would be late. Hmm, maybe she could ser serve the stew as it is. She grabbed the ladle, took another tentative sip and ugh, no. Salt was a necessity. Kira shook her head slowly. Her first instinct was to seek out a neighbor and ask if she could borrow some, bringing along a small gift of thanks in return. Then that made more sense than trekking all the way to the caverns. In fact, there's certainly what she would have done back in the old days when, nope, 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 stop, 
anything she would have done in the old days was a memory trap, even something as simple as visiting a neighbor. No sense taking even another moment to ponder it. Besides, that was not how things were done here. Tree families mostly kept to themselves. They were aware of and might become acquainted with the people who lived in the closest surrounding trees, but not in any real or intimate way. She couldn't even see them most of the time since the individual homes were so well hidden. There was very little sharing of resources. People were expected to fend for themselves. The community structure did not lend itself to casual dropping by and asking if you could borrow some salt. Instead, she grabbed a large pouch from the hook, looped it around her shoulder so it rested on her back and prepared for her journey. She poured a gourd full of water over the flames and the fire disappeared with an angry hiss and a great poof of steam. It would be a pain to get it going again to reheat the stew, but there was no unattended fires when she lived in the treetops. Taking a deep breath, she walked out the front door and into the circular platform that surrounded the hut. Her stomach still flip-flopped whenever she stepped out here. Yes, she dimly remembered that she had once enjoyed running through the trees, but not this high. Up here, when the wind blew, the tree truck, the treetop would actually sway back and forth a lot. The entire house often slid this way and that as if in an earthquake. Sometimes at night, her hammock would rock, feeling like someone was pushing her. The rest of the family found this quite soothing, like being a baby in a big cradle. But Kira didn't think she ever get used to it. On particularly blusty nights, she would hold the fibers of the hammock in a white knuckled grip until either the wind died down or she passed out from exhaustion, whichever came first. The first step off the platform was always the hardest. The family had installed helpers, of course, small loops of rope dangling from surrounding branches to function as reliable hand and footholds. Planks had been fixed to nearby tree trunks to serve as ladders to branches that were thicker and easier to walk on. But still, that first step took her from the safety of a solidly constructed home to being far above the ground without any time to get used to the idea. Kira inhaled deeply as she oriented herself. The salt caverns were located in the southeast and Luan's father had carved the corresponding points of the compass around the rim of the hut's circular roof. Kira didn't need them at night, still knew how to navigate by the stars, but it certainly helped during the day. Checking twice to make sure she was headed in the right direction, she leaned forward slowly, grabbed onto two coils of rope for stability and stepped out. There was always half a moment that took her breath away when her foot had left the hut's platform and was stretched out over the open air. But that feeling dissipated mostly anyway, as soon as her foot was firmly on the branch. When she had first started living with Luan's family, she would leave through one of the trap doors and carefully climb down their home tree all the way to the ground and then make her way around by walking on the forest floor. But the more she hung out with Luan, who often went for weeks without ever touching the ground, the more confident she became. And now, even when she was by herself, she saw the value in traveling among the treetops. Her stomach plunged again when she jumped to the branches of the next tree, her entire body in the air, momentarily unanchored to anything. She always leaped towards the center of the trunk and kept reminding herself that it wouldn't be the end of the world if she missed a branch for some reason. Luan had reassured her that it wasn't like stepping off a cliff. She wouldn't plummet straight down 200 feet to the ground. There were countless branches between her and the forest floor. Think of it like this, he had said. The tree is your friend and it has a thousand arms that all want to catch you. She had spread out his own arms to demonstrate. I mean, sure, you might smack into a few of them and fall a bit further than you wanted to, here he shrugged, but eventually you'll be able to grab onto one of them and stop yourself from falling. It's, you know, guaranteed. Kira had winced, but wouldn't that hurt? Not as much as hitting the ground, splat he had punctuated this sentiment by closing his eyes, letting his tongue loll out the side of his mouth and making death rattle noises. 
Kira had lunged to give him a little splat against the head for that one, but Luan had just darted out of her reach and cackled his mischievous little laugh. But his advice calmed her nerves now as she made her way from branch to branch, tree trunk to tree trunk, heading in the direction of the salt caverns. Kira was especially thankful that it was still the dry season, although she knew the daily rainstorms would be starting up at any time. A dry branch always felt like a much safer option for supporting and balancing her body weight than a stretch of rain slick wood. She had been traveling for less than 10 minutes when she heard the muted but unmistakable sounds of a pack of hook hunters working its way through the area. Kira immediately found the thickest surrounding branch and took a seat, leaning back against the tree trunk for comfort. It was unwritten tree folk protocol to stay as still as possible when hook hunters passed by as they were able to race through the trees faster than anyone else in the community and running into someone else up here could have disastrous consequences. But Kira would have taken a break and peered out from behind the leaves anyway. She loved to watch them whenever she had the chance. First came the tracker. She came racing by two trees over and about 20 feet below, giving Kira a perfect view. The speed, as always, was breathtaking. The tracker held a slender stick in each hand, almost like a small spear, except each one ended in a hook instead of a sharpened point. A coiled leather strap was fashioned, fastened to the straight end and it looped around the tracker's wrist to make sure that her hand wouldn't lose its grip. As the woman dashed along the branches, she constantly worked the hooks above her head in a steady rhythm of activity. They looped over the limbs, providing a split second of traction and steadiness for the tracker before they were pulled off and transferred to the next spot. She almost looked like a spider, multiple appendages being used in coordination for mobility and stability. It was like a form of running where the arms were just as important as the legs. Only it isn't really running, Kira thought, more like gliding. For one thing, the tracker was angling downward and leveraging the pull of gravity as she was moving faster than Kira could run at a dead sprint on level ground. And when she needed to reverse course, the tracker would quickly raise herself several feet in the air by hooking higher and higher, pulling herself skyward and running straight up the trunk. She was able to leap from tree to tree with such confidence because the hooks were much more reliable than hands for finding purchase. There were no worries about tender palms being stabbed by a sharp off shook of branch and on smooth limbs, the hook slid right across the surface of the wood, giving the tracker an exhilarating ride. Kira assumed she would only get a brief glimpse of the proceedings, but she was in luck. Whatever creature the tracker was trailing, it was apparently lingering in the area. The tracker zoomed past Kira's perch, but after traversing seven or eight trees in a blur of activity, she slowly started to circle back, creating a loop where Kira sat on the outer edge. Tracking prey from this height served the hook hunters well. An animal being stalked on the ground could hear a twig snap from a hundred yards away or catch the tiniest movement out of their peripheral vision or even smell a hunter if the wind shifted slightly. But this high up, the animal's keen senses were taken out of play. The tracker was like a hawk stealthily pursuing its prey from the safety of the sky. Kira leaned forward, steadying herself with a strong grip on two neighboring branches to see if she could identify what was on the hunter's dinner menu tonight. She watched the tracker out of the corner of her eye as she scanned what little she could see of the ground far below. The woman with the hooks was narrowing her loop, dropping a few branches lower with each pass, so Kira trained her vision on the center of that imaginary circle. There, in the clearing, through the leaves, Kira saw a flash of movement, a boar, a mighty big one too, from what she could make out at this height. As soon as the animal popped into view, she heard the tracker's shrill whistle pierce the forest air. Time for phase two. 
Kira watched the surrounding woods and here came the spotters, a boy and a girl, not much older than Kira and so much alike they had to be twins. With their coordinated movements, it seemed as though they'd been born for the job. The girl popped out of the branches on the eastern side of the tracker's tightening circle. While the boy came from the west, they both looked to the tracker who was standing on the tip of a branch that was dipping dangerously. She kept one hook around an overhead branch for stability as she leaned out into the open air at an impossible angle. With her other hook, she pointed down at the boar, tracing its movements as it grunted its way through the forest and perhaps trying to hunt down a meal of its own. The spotters, taking their cue, started to circle in the air above the animal, nimbly hooking their way from limb to limb, continuing to tighten the loop like a noose. With each pass, they dropped a few branches lower, getting closer and closer to their prey. The tracker followed suit, staying equidistant between the two spotters, perfectly triangulating the beast below. Kira's heart sped up and she gripped the branches more tightly in anticipation. Almost time for the main event. If she was this nervous just watching, she couldn't imagine how her body would be reacting if she were the one about to. The kill signal was given. All three hunters, much closer together now, pulled a string on the end of each of their hooks, unfurling bright red squares of cloth that flapped in the breeze like flags. They waved them overhead three times and then pointed to the same spot on the ground. From her bird's eye vantage point above them, the space between their bodies looked like a tunnel leading right to their prey below. Kira looked up and here came the final member of the team, the pouncer. If it had looked like the tracker was gliding, then the pouncer was flying. He dropped out of the sky like a stone, falling impossible lengths through the open air before hooking a branch or two in order to shift direction or control his speed. He zoomed past Kira in a dizzying rush, but completely silent, just like a diving bird of prey. She watched as he plunged, steering himself in between his team members and dropped right through their triangle of flags. As he became a tiny doll figure far below, he hooked the lowest level of branches, then let himself fall the rest of the way to the ground. Kira could just faintly make out the terrified squeal of the boar, which must never have known it was being stalked. The tracker and two spotters tied up their flags and then dropped to the ground themselves, ready to help with the butchering or to make a travoy if they had to drag their prize any distance. Whichever was the case, their families would be eating very well tonight. Kira stood and stretched, working the kinks out of her legs. She really shouldn't have taken the time to watch all that. Dinner was going to be even later, but she just couldn't resist the show. She started to make her way southeasterly again, only now, after watching the fluidly coordinated movements of the hook hunters, she felt like a clumsy toddler inching her way along. And the thought of all that boar meat was making her hungry. The soup in the pot back home would be good. She was certain, but it was no substitute for a fresh haunch of wild pig, slow roasted over an open flame. She could almost smell it. Kira was so caught up in her dinner fantasies, she didn't take careful note of her surroundings. She stepped on a branch that was rigged to work as a trip wire. A great stone dropped from a hidden perch in the tree, pulling a rope that made the net cinch up into a ball with her inside. She had been captured. That's the end of chapter 10.